All right, so welcome to my series of videos on managerial economics. And in this particular video, I'm going to introduce you to consumer behavior. So kindly take a moment, kindly like, subscribe, share, and most importantly, subscribe to this channel. Now, at the end of this lecture, um, we are going to understand certain aspects of the consumer behavior. And this is very important for managers because managers have to make decisions thinking about how consumers will behave. But since managers do not have total control over consumer behavior, it is good that we use certain economic concepts to reduce consumer behavior to a point where we can understand. So at the end of this lecture, you are going to understand what a consumer behavior is in terms of the standard economic model. You understand the concept of total utility and marginal utility. You understand the concept of consumer preference and the concept of indifference here. Now, even though consumers always want to maximize their satisfaction, they will have certain constraints. So after this, you are going to also talk about certain constraints that are faced by consumers and we restrict ourselves to the constraint of their budget. Now, at this very moment that you are listening to this video, you realize that your heart is pumping, of course. Every part of your body is working. Your eyes are even scanning the slice. Your ears are even hearing me. Now, this simply means that the human brain processes so many things at a time. The human brain can even process things that supercomputers can also do. So this simply means that there is complexities in human thought process and managers need to understand or develop an economic model to understand how consumer thinks because our mind or our brains are very complex and understanding how we behave is very difficult. So then we need a model that will help us understand or reduce this abstract phenomenon to the concept where we can at least understand some aspect of consumer behavior. So to talk about consumer behavior, we need to know who a consumer is, what his behavior is, and then what consumer behavior is. So when we talk about a consumer, essentially, consumer is just an individual that purchases goods and services from firms for consumption. Okay, so consumer is basically anyone who buys goods and services for consumption. Now, the word behavior also refers to a certain action or reaction of a person under a specified situation. And that is what behavior is. How people act or they react under a certain situation is their behavior. So putting these two concepts together, consumer behavior refers to how consumers, as in people that purchase goods and services from firms, how these people react or respond to alternative choices that confront them. So what is the essence then of consumer behavior? Consumer behavior is very important because you see, as a manager, if you understand how consumers think, or if you understand how they behave, it will help you to price your products profitably. It will also enable you to do some kind of advert that will appeal to the consumers. It also helps you in designing your product in a way that will appeal to the consumers, etc. Now, this simply means that even though you may spend time, you may spend resources as a manager to forecast demand, your, the forecast of your demand is as accurate as understanding consumer behavior because a manager's need for practical analysis of demand will require them to understand or develop an economic model that will help them understand consumer behavior so that you can do proper demand and supply analysis. Once you don't understand consumer behavior, it is quite difficult to even do proper demand analysis because the consumers are the entities or the people that are going to consume your goods. So once you don't understand their behavior, even sometimes predicting demand is quite puzzling. Now, 
if you want to an, if you want to reduce the abstract consumer behavior into a standard economic model, we may analyze it this way. Now, when a consumer walks into the shop, he has a wide range of goods and services he can choose. <laughs> of course, even though he has a wide range of goods and services he can choose, what you must know is that the person has limited financial resources. Like for instance, when you walk into a mall, if you have all the money in this world, you can buy all the things you wish to buy in the mall. But once you don't have all the money in this world, what it simply means is that out of your limited resources, you have to make a choice as a consumer. So how are choices made? Now, to understand consumer behavior in this sense, one assumption we can make is that if a consumer wants to make a choice, number one, he will look at, first of all, look at his income, if he can afford it. The fact that I want to make a choice and I cannot afford means that I shouldn't make that choice because I cannot afford. So number one, he will look at his income. Now, how would the consumer know whether he can afford or not once he has the income? He will know it based on the prices of the various goods and services offered for sale. So once I have an income of 100 CDs and the price of the good is, let's say, two CDs, I know I can buy 50 of it, okay? So apart from the income and then the price, obviously, it must give the consumer value. It must give him satisfaction. So in making consumption choices, a consumer may consider his income. And because he's considering his income, he needs to be aware of the prices to see whether his income can afford it. And it's not only about the price in, in any case, it must also give the consumer value. The fact that I have money, I've seen the price of something, I want to buy it, does not necessarily mean that the thing will give me value. So we are here, we are looking, the consumer will look at both affordability as well as the satisfaction he will derive from consuming the commodity. Now, for us to understand consumer behavior in this standard economic model, we need to make certain assumptions about consumer behavior. Number one, number one is that buyers or economic agents, or in this sense, consumers are rational. Now, when we say consumers are rational, what it simply means is that they will always want to maximize their interest. Any rational person with a limited income wants to maximize his interest or wants to maximize his interest. Now, the second assumption we make about consumer behavior is that consumers always prefer more to less. Now, if you give a consumer a basket of goods and that basket contains five, five units of the product and you give the consumer another basket of goods and that basket contains 10 units of the same product, and you ask him to make a choice, the consumer is definitely going to choose the one which has 10 units. And this simply means that always consumers prefer more to less. Consumers always prefer more to less. The third thing is that when consumers buy a product, they always seek to maximize their satisfaction. And that is what we normally refer to as value for money. If anybody is buying an item, the, 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 the moment the person is rational, the moment more is preferred to less, the person will always want to obtain higher satisfaction from his purchase. So here, what I want you to know is that consumers always seek to maximize their satisfaction. And in economics, satisfaction is also synonymous to the word utility. So utility in economics simply means the satisfaction we derive from consuming a product. The last assumption we make here is that consumers always act in self-interest and do not consider the utility of others. Consumers always act in self-interest and do not consider the utility of others. Now, for us to delve deeper into consumer behavior, there are two key concepts we need to understand. Number one is consumer opportunities. Number two is consumer preference. And what I want you to understand is that, you see, not, it's not anything that consumers can afford. Is, um, I mean, consumers will not necessarily buy anything they can afford, okay? So what I want you to know is that certain rich people 
or if 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 somebody has enough money, okay, it doesn't mean that he will buy everything. The fact that he can afford something does not mean he will buy. So here, consumer opportunities is simply the possible goods and services that the consumer can afford. So consumer opportunities is simply the possible goods and services that the consumer can afford to consume. Meanwhile, the ones that he will actually consume or the one that he prefers to consume is called consumer preference. So whilst consumer opportunities is what he can afford to consume, consumer preference is what you, he will actually consume. Consumer preference is what you actually consume. So in analyzing consumer behaviors, one of the things you must know as a manager is that you must always make decisions or you must always follow consumer preferences, not their opportunities. Because opportunities is what they can afford. Preferences is what they actually want to consume. Now, if consumer preferences is that important, it means that we need to understand the properties of consumer preference. So once consumer preference is important, we need to understand the properties of consumer preference. Now here, before we delve into consumer preferences like its properties, we need to understand a concept called consumption bundle. And here, you are going to make an assumption that the consumer only consumes two products in this world, product X and product Y. Because in understanding the consumer behavior, we need to simplify consumer behavior by making certain assumptions. So here, we are making another assumption that consumer only consumes only two commodities in this world. That is good X and good Y. And then the basket of good X and Y is called a bundle. So technically, consumption bundle is the combinations of goods and services. So here, if we restrict ourselves to good X and Y, what it means is that consumption bundle will be a basket that has a certain number of good X and a certain number of good Y. So here, if you look at this diagram here, we have bundle A, bundle E, bundle B, bundle C, F, and D. Now, if you watch bundle A carefully, it means that bundle A has 60 units of Y and has 10 units of X. If you watch bundle E, it means that bundle E has 50, five zero units of Y and 20 units of X. If you look at bundle B, bundle B has 40 units of Y and 20 units of X. So for us to understand consumer preferences, as I mentioned, we need to understand what a consumption bundle is, all right? And here, bundle C here, has 20 units of Y and 40 units of X. So this is typically a consumption bundle, the combination of goods and services. And I've told you that here, we are limiting ourselves to only two goods, so good Y and then good X. So every bundle will contain a certain amount of good Y and a certain amount of good X. Now, what are the important assumptions or what are the important properties of consumer preference? One of the important properties of consumer preference is that consumer preference must be complete. And secondly, consumer preference must be transitive. So number one, consumer preference must be complete. Number two, consumer preference must be transitive. And these things are assumptions we make on how people rank their goods because people rank their goods based on their preferences. Now, when you say your preferences are complete, it means that as a consumer, you must be able to rank your preferences according to your level of satisfaction. As a consumer, you should be able to rank your preferences as uh, according to your level of satisfaction. So here, what I want you to know is that given two bundles, let's say bundle A and B, 
a consumer will prefer bundle A to B because bundle A gives him a higher level of satisfaction. So he will prefer bundle A to B when bundle A gives him a higher level of satisfaction. On the other hand, the consumer may prefer B to A because B gives me a higher level of satisfaction. Or the consumer will be indifferent between the two bundles if it gives him the same level of satisfaction. So the assumption of completeness says that you prefer A to B if A gives you a higher level of satisfaction, or you prefer B to A if B gives you a higher level of satisfaction, or you'll be indifferent between A and B if they give you the same level of satisfaction. When it comes to the um, concept of completeness, what it simply means is that you shouldn't be asked the question and you say, I don't know. You should be able to say, I prefer A to B because A gives me a high level of satisfaction, or I prefer B to A because B gives me a high level of satisfaction, or I'm indifferent between A and B because they give me the same level of satisfaction. Another assumption that we make about consumer preferences is that consumer preferences must be transitive. So the, the assumption of transitivity. Now, if your preferences are transitive, what it simply means is that it must be consistent in, this, in such a way that if you prefer A to B and you prefer bundle B to C, you must definitely prefer A to C. Just think about it. If you walk into a supermarket, you prefer product A to product B, and you prefer product B to product C. Definitely, you must prefer product A to product C. Otherwise, if you rather prefer C to A, you just go round and round in circles without making a choice. It means your preferences are not transitive. So the assumption of transitivity says that if, if you prefer A to B and you prefer B to C, you must then prefer A to C. And that is the assumption of, um, that is the property of transitivity. Now here, we have been talking about satisfaction for a while. Now there are some economists that believe, there are some economists that believe that satisfaction can be ranked. And there are some economists that believe that satisfaction can be measured in terms of um, figures. So that, that part of economists that believes that satisfaction can be ranked, they are called the ordinalists. And that's, um, Economists that believe that satisfaction can be measured in units, they are called the cardinalists. So here, for now, we are going to take the cardinalist approach. Now, this simply means that the unit of measurement of satisfaction here is called util. All right, util. The unit of measurement of satisfaction here is referred to as util. U-T-I-L-S, utils. Now, Let's look at this scenario. Let's say you work for 15 hours. You are hot, sweaty, and very thirsty. Now you come across an ice water seller and decide to buy some. Now, if you were asked to rank the satisfaction you get from buying the ice water, you realize that you rank the satisfaction or you don't even mention figures, you mention it like a very high figure. So, so let's say you mention something like 10 utils. That means that in consuming the first sachet, you realize that you got a very high level of consumption from it. Now let's assume that you buy the second sachet of water. Then if you're asked to rank it, or you're asked to even um, mention a figure for it, you will give a figure less than the 10 because you have already consumed the first unit. Now when you are consuming the second unit, the satisfaction you get from consuming the second one will definitely be less than the first one. That's consumer behavior, okay? This tells a certain concept that as you consume more and more of a product, as you consume more and more of a product, the additional satisfaction, in this case referred to as the marginal utility, also diminishes or it falls. So if you consume more and more of a product, the additional satisfaction or the marginal utility you get 
from consuming the product also begins to decline. And this concept is called the law of diminishing marginal utility. This concept is called the law of diminishing marginal utility. Now, if utility can be measured in figures, what it simply means is that we can have a function. Of course, if demand is measured in units and if utility is measured in utils, what it simply means is that we can have a function for utility. Anything that can be measured in figures can be modeled with functions, okay? So utility can have a function. Now let's assume that the utility function here is total utility is equal to 20X plus 40Y. So total utility is equal to 20X plus 40Y. Then it says we should find utility if we consume two units of X and five units of Y. Remember, the function is 20x plus 40y. So here, utility is equal to 20x plus 40y. Then it asks us that how many units will we consume if we consume two units of x and five units of y? So we are consuming two units of x and five units of Y. So our utility will be 20 into bracket two plus 40 into bracket five. So when you multiply, you are going to get 240 units. Okay, now if the function was rather giving us 2x squared plus 16y, so if we give another function, 2x squared plus 16y, and we are supposed to find the utility when we consume two units of y, sorry, of x, and five units of y, when you model this mathematically, you have u is equal to two into bracket two squared plus 16 into bracket five. Okay, so two into bracket two squared, that portion will be eight. And then 16 times five, that portion will be 80. So the answer will be 88. Now from these same functions, we can find marginal utility. So if total utility is equal to 20x plus 40y, then you want to find marginal utility of x, it will be changing total utility over changing x. And our answer will be equal to 20. So when you differentiate with respect to x, you have 20 here. And since there is no x here, this thing will turn into zero. And you want to find marginal utility of y, you're changing total utility with respect to y. So over changing y. And that's going to be 40. Now, the other function too, we can do the same. The other function is u is equal to 2x squared plus 16y. So if you want to find marginal utility of x, it's going to be 4x. So if you differentiate with respect to x, you're going to have 4x because 2 multiply 2, that's 4. Then the power minus 1, so we have 4x. There's no x here. So this will, here, if you differentiate this part, it will turn to zero. And then mu of y will be 16, if you differentiate with respect to y. And these functions are pretty simple. These functions are pretty simple to do. So in the next video, I'm going to talk about the concept of the indifference curve. Can you like, subscribe, share and most importantly let's get your comments and your feedback but subscribe to the channel thank you